Hello, my name is Dr. Carol Blaney, and the purpose of this short video series is to share my work in subatomic physics and to share a theory I've developed that is actually pretty easy to understand. It could be called a unification theory because it bridges the forces of the very large to the extremely small, and it could ultimately help us on our path to obtain cheaper, greener energy from our most abundant resource, matter, or from another lesser discussed abundant resource, the zero-point energy field, which is the energy field of vacuum of free space. You can read about it and how we know it's there and so forth in some of the more prominent physics journals. As a PhD chemical engineer, my strategy to solving the energy crisis is as follows. Find the weakest link in the science of extracting energy out of matter and strengthen that weakest link. I believe that the weakest link is our lack of understanding of what E equals mc squared really means. E equals mc squared says that the most light energy that you can get out of mass is just mass times the speed of light squared. But how does mass energy become light energy? What is it about mass that it can even become light? Until we understand that, we aren't going to be able to extract clean energy with no radioactive waste, that is, out of matter. Well, so a few years ago, I set about to understand what light was such that it, it could become mass, and what mass was such that it could become light. The first question I asked was the obvious. How can light, which travels in a straight line, become a chunk of mass or matter that sits still and is difficult to move and so forth, has inertia? Is it about mass such that it can become light? One day while taking a walk in nature, a possible solution popped into my head. Could a stationary mass particle actually be a photon of light that's somehow just trapped in a tiny volume? A circle so tiny or a sphere so tiny that it seems like a point? Maybe to us it just looks like mass? But maybe it's actually still light, but just somehow condensed or trapped into a tiny volume or circle too small to even imagine. Well, I rushed to calculate the diameter of this light ring, as I called it, this, this light photon held into a circular path. I figured its own gravity could hold it into its circular path, and that's the diameter I tried to calculate, its own gravity. Well, I calculated that from its energy, E equals h nu, h being the Planck's constant, and nu being the frequency of that photon. My calculated radius was just what I'd imagined. It was on the order of Planck's length, meaning that it is as small or smaller than anything we humans can ever hope to imagine to measure with our current instruments. So is mass just light traveling in tiny volume? Herein was my journey's beginning. And since then, I've developed a theory for the zero point field, a theory for what a photon is, and a theory for what matter is. In a nutshell, my work continues where Albert Einstein left off with his general theory of relativity and E equals mc squared. Then it develops it further at small Planck scale lengths. Now my graduate courses in fluid dynamics helped me to visualize fluid flowing in three-dimensional space fairly easily. So for me to be able to grasp Einstein's general theory, instead of trying to envision warped space-time, it was much easier for me to imagine that a gravitational body causes space to accelerate into it, which is really the same thing. It's just a different way of visualizing it. And as you know, um, according to the accounts that I've read, Einstein originally thought of it this way too. It was only when he collaborated with the mathematician Minkowski to solve his complicated equations that Einstein combined the three dimensions of space with one dimension of time to come up with four-dimensional space-time. In my view, the use of space-time was first and foremost to solve the complicated equations, not really to provide insight. And the way I see it, space-time is very poorly understood because it's just hard to envision four dimensions in our mind. It's a lot easier to imagine a video of space moving as time progresses. So I'm going to revert back to the pre-Minkowski language and use three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. And I won't even use the word warped space-time 
but something much easier to uh, visualize, which I call etheric acceleration. Now, ether is spelled A-E-T-H-E-R, and the A-E stands for Albert Einstein's initials because this is directly following his work. So if we can look at gravitational bodies in this way, we will conclude that a gravitational body causes ether to accelerate towards it. It's the well-known equivalence principle taught by Einstein in his famous elevator thought experiment. That's where he realizes that you in a rocket accelerating through space and feeling the g-force on your body is equivalent to you standing on Earth and having space accelerate through you. Mathematically, this space accelerating through you as you stand on the Earth's surface can be described by a vector field, which I like to call the etheric acceleration vector field. Every gravitational body has one. The closer you get to the Earth, the bigger the acceleration vector is at that point. Well, this concept of etheric acceleration can be, be visualized now as follows. Imagine the mass of Earth is compressed into a tiny point of almost zero radius. Now, imagine that you're floating out in space surrounded by the vacuum. And imagine that this vacuum is filled with sparkling fairy dust, each particle popping into and out of existence like glitter. And these little pieces of glitter have minuscule mass. Now watch as the fairy dust falls towards this gravitational speck, our speck of Earth. As the fairy dust is pulled along into this accelerating ether, it falls and falls and it gathers speed until the point that it reaches the center where it's going infinite speed. That is the confusing singularity that the general theory expresses. Now in my work, I take Einstein's general theory another step and I introduce curvature into the inwardly accelerating etheric flow at small length scales. This step removes the singularity. So instead of converging to a point and causing a mathematical singularity, my theory claims that the gravitationally induced flowing ether spirals inwardly in a curved flow pattern. Now you may be wondering what causes the etheric accelerating flow to curve. This concept of spiraling etheric flow was inspired by me watching all sorts of fluids flowing in nature throughout my life. Flowing water, turbulence at the base of a waterfall, rising smoke, tornadoes, and even those Einstein condensates. I notice how they all naturally flow into vortex patterns. In my fluid dynamical model for a photon of light, I claim that just like other fluids, this flowing ether naturally wants to flow into a vortex. And I discuss in later chapters, it turns out to be a self-propelling vortex. Its tip can't go faster than the speed of light, C, I claim, due to the properties of my fluid dynamical model of the zero point energy described in chapter one. So that's my model for light. Now my model for mass looks like this. I claim that ether accelerates inwardly in a pattern that actually forms the mass. And it doesn't flow into a circle or a ring, but something more like a toroid. It has to, in my later uh, discussions, explain why and how with simple video demonstrations. In my book, which I'm presenting here via a series of chapters, I begin by sharing my fluid dynamical model of this zero point energy, which I call ether. I agree with other scientists that this zero point energy field is comprised of a fluid which is electromagnetic in nature. It's turbulent at all length scales, just like in the massive ocean where you can find small eddies existing inside a larger whirlpool. I propose that this ether is filled with eddies nested within larger eddies. In fact, I propose a fractally nested series of eddies nested within eddies. Each one of these eddies gives rise to a local etheric acceleration vector field, along with the second vector field describing the local rotational flow of the fluid, or the curl. Next, I have a model for light which is formed when this ether flows into a stable vortex flow pattern. 
As I mentioned before, the turbulence of the ether, according to my model, prevents it from exceeding a certain velocity, a velocity which we measure as the speed of light. Third, I present a model for mass. By condensing the light photon's vortex flow pattern into a ring structure, I propose you get mass. In particular, I propose that an electron is a mass particle that is an accelerating etheric flow pattern shaped like a toroid, which I demonstrate qualitatively has the properties of charge repulsion and attraction, all from the perspectives of fluid dynamics. Now you may ask, how would one condense light into mass? Isn't light happy enough going in a straight line? What would make it condense into a ring form? Well, have you ever seen the intelligent dolphins form bubble rings? First, the dolphin blows an air-filled vortex in the water with its snout. Next, it uses its snout or nose to bend the vortex into a circle. As soon as the tip of the vortex touches another place along the backbone of the vortex, it forms a semi-stable bubble ring. Similarly, I envision this vortex of light being bent or distorted just right, say in a supernova explosion when collisions with nearby entities cause it to bend. Then its tip comes close enough to its own tail so that they attract. In fact, the tip and the tail merge to form a new etheric flow pattern, which is that of, overall, a rotating toroid. This is because the tip of the vortex, with its strong, inwardly rotating, inwardly accelerating ether, gravitationally attracts its own tail. That's why I like to call it a light ring. I calculated its diameter to be on the order of Planck's length, and the math also predicts that it is made of a high-energy gamma ray. The charge of the electron arises, I claim, from the curl of the etheric acceleration vector field. By envisioning light and mass to be these types of accelerating etheric flow patterns, we can start to understand what gravity actually is etheric acceleration and how gravity can flow into curved patterns which form massive objects which have inertia and charge. It turns out that a universe with this type of ether, this type of light, mass, gravity and charge and so forth has to be a universe that expands at an accelerating rate as modern telescopes observe. My model also addresses the questions, what is dark matter and what is dark energy? I propose that what we observe and label as dark matter near galaxies is caused by the inwardly accelerating ether that flows into the zero point field's energy fluctuations, as described in my fluid dynamical model for the ether. I then ask the question, is dark matter more abundant in the vicinity of galaxies as we measure due to the extra turbulence of the ether there compared, say, to the more placid regions of space between galaxies where the zero-point energies would be expected to be less. I also offer a possible explanation for dark energy. Might it be caused by an equal and opposite outward flow of etheric acceleration to balance the inward flow of etheric acceleration that flows into mass, light, and most importantly, into the ether with its dark matter, and which I claim is a requirement of the basic laws of thermodynamics. In my theory, I also offer possible fluid dynamical explanations for the strong and weak nuclear forces. I consider whether certain physical forces can be predicted by the curls of the fractally nested etheric flow patterns, averaged over different length scales. If this average curl of the etheric vector field of one entity is in the opposite flow direction to the curl of the etheric vector field of another entity, they will repel. But if the curls of the bodies point in the same direction, they will attract. I explain the reasoning behind my claims in later chapters, again using fluid dynamical considerations. So to summarize my theory, the vacuum of free space, or the zero-point field, forms a turbulent fluid which I propose a model for and call ether. 
it flows like a very low viscosity fluid with a viscosity too low to even imagine. And its nested flow patterns make up everything in the universe. Light. A proposed photon of light is formed when this ether flows into a tiny stable vortex of a particular length scale. Next, I propose a model for mass as follows. Under the right conditions, I claim that this stable vortex of ether, this light photon I just mentioned, can be condensed into a stable toroidal etheric flow pattern, which I like to call a light ring. It has the properties of mass and charge. I also propose, as many have in the past, that gravity is in fact etheric acceleration. I discuss how the etheric acceleration vector field and its curl vector field can qualitatively explain not only charge, but the strong and weak nuclear forces. My theory, based on etheric flow, appears to me to have the potential to explain the four physical forces with one unified view, and thus bridge the very large to the very small. I envision that this is what a unification theory should look like, and I would love to hear your comments. I look forward to exchanging ideas on this topic so that we can come to a better understanding of what light and matter really are, and that will ultimately help us figure out how to get clean, safe, and sustainable energy for, for humanity, whether it's applied to nuclear fusion or to other mass-to-light energy generators. Thank you.